All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll go ahead and get started. I think we have a critical mass. Everybody seems to have taken their place. On behalf of the Case Western Reserve University School of Law, I am uh, Professor Michael Scharf, Director of the Frederick K. Cox International Law Center, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to a really extraordinary event this morning. Let me begin with a little introduction about our international law program and the law school, and then I'll introduce our speaker, and um, we will be in for a real treat of a speech this morning that I'm sure will be unforgettable for all of us. The International Law Center here was established 15 years ago with a endowment by the Gunn Foundation, which is now $4 million in value, making us the most well-endowed international law program in the country. And well, it's great, yeah. And, and with that money, we have been able to climb up the rankings. So this year, we are now ranked 16th, tied with Stanford and Cornell universities as one of the top elite international law programs. In 2005, the prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone nominated our war crimes program for the Nobel Peace Prize. And um, he threw my name in there, too, which was quite nice. <laughs> nice jump start to a career in Cleveland. Um, last year, the students who are on our International Law Moot Court team, the Jessup Moot Court competition, participated in the national rounds and the international rounds, and out of 600 schools from around the world, from 120 countries, we won the world championship. And I want to uh, recognize the two students, three students who are here, who were on that team last year, um, who are here today. Um, Margot Day, who was the best speaker in the world. Um, stand up. Uh, Pat Dowd. And Brianne Draffin. And thank you. And Margot and Pat are back this year, um, and they're joined with Nikki Dasarathi and Sarah Pierce. So you guys here? I, I see Nikki, Sarah, um, who are, are bound to determine to repeat as world champions, and they're doing everything possible for that. So anyway, the international law program has really been doing well here. We're very excited, and we thank you all for coming to our events every uh, semester and for supporting us in many other ways. Um, this wouldn't be possible if not for the support also of my faculty colleagues and of those of you in the room and the students who come and really are our force multiplier. Um, the dean of the law school, uh, Bob Rawson, who is fantastic. Um, he's was the managing partner of Jones Day, Revis and Pogue, the second largest law firm in the world. And he's been a real big supporter of international law. He was supposed to be here to do the introduction and present the award today. Um, and unfortunately, he had a conflict on the West Coast and couldn't get back. And it's not that we are trying to develop a Pol Pot like cult of personality. Um, his photo was supposed to be the one in the book. But at the last minute, we replaced it with mine. I just wanted you guys to know that. Um, yeah. But so now, so it does fall on me to um, introduce the uh, speaker today and to give him our prestigious award. Five years ago, we decided to use some of our endowment to create an award called the Humanitarian Award for Advancing Global Justice that would go to someone who is an extraordinary individual who for the last year has done the most, in our opinion, to advance global justice throughout the world. The first recipient was the Under Secretary General of the United Nations for Legal Affairs, Hans Carell. The next year, we had Philippe Kirsch, who was the president of the International Criminal Court. That was followed by Thomas Bergenthal, the US judge on the International Court of Justice. And then last year, you probably all remember if you were here, we had Luis Moreno Ocampo, the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. Well, we try to make this timely, and you couldn't be more timely than this year's recipient, because after 30 years, the Khmer Rouge leaders, who were responsible for the famous killing fields slaughters and genocides in Cambodia are finally being brought to justice. And this has been a long, long struggle, including negotiations that lasted a decade and building a court from scratch. And it's an extraordinary court, which you'll be hearing about. And it is being led, this effort, by an extraordinary individual um, because 
the challenges that he faces are more than any other international tribunal, and you'll be hearing some more about that. We've been fortunate for the last several years to be involved in his work. Our students have been sending him memoranda on research issues that he requests our advice on. Uh, four years ago, he invited me to come down and help train his staff um, and bring them up to speed. And then on my sabbatical last fall, he had me as part of his office. And I was um, happy to join some of my students who are working over there um, and worked on the brief on joint criminal enterprise. What I found amazing is that I've worked with all the international tribunals around the world, and they're all a bit dysfunctional, um, except for his staff. He's really created a family atmosphere. Everybody has this shared mission, and I've never seen a more efficient and happy group. And that really goes to the credit also. You can't be a humanitarian unless you start in-house in and treat your own people well, and you can get the most of them from that. And it's something I try to model myself after with the, the work I do here. You're, you're a great role model. So for all those reasons, Robert, it is our distinct pleasure to present to you this year's award for being the humanitarian of the year um, for advancing global justice. And if you come up here, I'll present that. And let me just tell you briefly about Robert. Um, he didn't just wake up one morning and was prosecutor of the Cambodia Tribunal. Uh, what happened was he started out as a prosecutor in Canada. And after a long career there, he went off to Kosovo and prosecuted war crimes there. Then he went to, Ru to Arusha, Tanzania, where the Rwanda Tribunal is, and prosecuted war crimes there. Then he went off to Sierra Leone, and we have some students here who have done uh, internships there for him as well. And he is the most well-traveled and most experienced international prosecutor in the world. So when it was time to find someone to put together the challenging Cambodia prosecution, there was nobody who stood out like Robert Petit. And what we're going to hear today is about what he's managed to do and the challenges ahead. Um, the photos in the background, I think, give you a sense of uh, sort of what um, the photos include, pictures of the defendants and some of the atrocities and the courtroom. And we're really excited to hear about it from you. Thank you again. Thank you very much. So just uh, Robert will talk for about a half hour, and then we'll have about 45 minutes for question and answer. Um, and that's the part that we all seem to like the best. So, and he's, he's very good off the cuff. And um, we're, we are broadcasting this worldwide, um, so it's not Chatham House rules, but he'll try to be as forthcoming as possible. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, and. Um, let me say first that I'm very, very much uh, mindful of the honor uh, and very grateful and humbled, uh, especially considering the list of prior uh, recipients, much more deserving than I am. Uh, and I really appreciate it, and hopefully we'll live up to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to this award in the next few years that I'm still doing this sort of thing. Um, as Michael said, um, or hinted, uh, have been around. Um, the uh, Cambodia court is actually my fourth tribunal. Uh, I started out uh, in Rwanda, uh, and then Kosovo, East Timor, uh, Sierra Leone, uh, and now uh, Cambodia. I pretty much, I'm pretty sure that's going to be the last one for a while, uh, but uh, or so says my wife. Um, um, anyways. Uh, Michael has told me a little bit about uh, the audience and who some of you are, uh, but since there is probably going to be a different level of uh, knowledge and understanding about the court, uh, I'm going to start off, and I apologize if I'm uh, boring you, some of you, with it, but some background on the court so that uh, you guys can get a better idea of where we're at here. Uh, in 1975, uh, some of you are old enough to remember, um, the Khmer Rouge, or a group that was later revealed to be the Khmer Rouge, uh, took over in Cambodia. Uh, for the next three years, eight months, and 20 days, um, they proceeded to do something that I don't think any group had ever tried before or since, not in, certainly not in this, uh, in this way. They proceeded to fundamentally alter Cambodian society based on ideology. Um, one could say that any political group does that, uh, but obviously not with the same method and certainly not with the same, uh, let's say, zeal. 
uh, they wanted to turn Cambodia into some kind of utopian peasant base uh, economy and country. Uh, and to do so, the leaders and uh, the members of the Khmer Rouge agreed to basically uh, deny Cambodians every single fundamental rights that we know and that we take for granted. They abolished everything that you can think of, uh, starting with the right to life, uh, the right to liberty, uh, any justice system, uh, the economy uh, was reduced uh, to basically barter level uh, economy. Religion was eliminated. Uh, cities were forcibly emptied uh, because of their uh, Maoist based ideology. Uh, the only good Khmer was a peasant Khmer. Uh, they forcibly emptied all the, the cities and uh, the residents had to be uh, or were evacuated into commune uh, in the countryside and forced to work on hard labor projects or uh, agricultural projects. And I think it's safe to say uh, that since about maybe between a million and two million Cambodians died as a result of the Khmer Rouge policies during those three years and eight months, uh, every Cambodian living today uh, can be considered a victim of that regime. And that is certainly how we are approaching the work that we do uh, in, uh, in our uh, perspective about what this court means to Cambodians. Now, uh, as I said, from 1975 to 79, uh, the Khmer Rouge were in power. Finally, in January 79, uh, a Vietnamese uh, armed force invasion uh, threw them out, although they remained for quite a number of years, actually. Uh, not only a military force, uh, but they also remained, because of world politics, uh, the official government of Cambodia, having a seat uh, at the UN for Cambodia for many years afterwards. Um, this was eventually uh, withdrawn, and uh, eventually, uh, through a negotiation yesterday, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about, uh, the remaining Khmer Rouge came in from the cold, let's say. But in 1979, when the Vietnamese did take over, uh, and when the world although there was knowledge of the atrocities that were being committed, but because the regime was so secretive, uh, not probably a, you know, as thorough knowledge as it should have been. But in 1979, when it did become clear uh, the level of atrocities, the Vietnamese decided to put on a trial. Uh, they tried in absentia uh, the number one leader of the movement, Pol Pot, Salat Sar, a.k.a. Pol Pot, and Yang Sari, who was during the Khmer Rouge era uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. They were tried in absentia for what was termed genocide and uh, found guilty, um, as is sometimes the case, and I'm not going to talk about recent situation <coughs> in Iraq. Uh, sometimes you have very good evidence but lousy procedures uh, and a trial that doesn't meet what we would you know, term international standards. Um, just to give you an idea, the first words of the defense lawyer for Yang Sari and Paul Pot, an American uh, lady from New York, I believe, was, my clients, those monsters, are certainly guilty, or some words to that effect. <laughs> so, uh, nonetheless, the evidence brought forth was compelling, and uh, the world, if it didn't know then, certainly realized the level of atrocities that were inflicted on the Cambodian people during that time. Uh, they were found guilty, as I said. Uh, well, they were found guilty and in absentia and condemned to death. That was, until we came around, the only uh, accountability for those crimes uh, until we started work in 2006. Part of that is, again, because of political reasons. Uh, another reason is because from 79 to um, the time that uh, the government of Cambodia requested assistance to set up the trial in 1997, Cambodia went through still a lot of upheaval and a lot of uh, major uh, issues, let's say. But in 1997, the government of Cambodia, the, headed by two co-prime ministers, this co-business goes back a long way, uh, one of them uh, being the current prime minister, Hun Sen, who was himself a Khmer Rouge, uh, at the time, but who had defected uh, before being purged and joined the Vietnamese forces. Um, the two co-prime ministers asked the UN formally uh, for assistance in setting up a court to account for the crimes of the Khmer Rouge. It recognized in its letter that 
Cambodia did not have the resources uh, to put together such an endeavor. And following this letter, uh, the UN and Cambodia entered into some very difficult negotiations. Um, technologically wise, if I keep walking around, this is not a problem for the video. It is, eh? <laughs> okay, I'll try not. <laughs> Too much caffeine. I'll try and work it up that way. So, after, no. um, I say long negotiations because the two partners, let's say, uh, took a very different approach. The government of Cambodia from the inception insisted that this trial process, this accountability process, must be Cambodian and Cambodian-led and dominated. Uh, it was a Cambodian problem requiring a Cambodian solution. The international community, mindful of the state of the justice system in Cambodia and of the emerging trends in international criminal law, wanted to make sure that the process, if it's going to be involved in it, was above boards, was in, uh, up to international standards. The two sides took a long time to agree, and at one point, actually, the UN walked out on the negotiations because it didn't feel that it could get uh, from the government an agreement on a structure that they would uh, be acceptable to them. Um, finally, uh, in 2004, uh, the government and the UN did agree and signed an agreement uh, creating the court. The court, however, three years beforehand had been sort of created by a Cambodian law uh, enacting an agreement that hadn't been signed yet. Um, so, it, it, you know, it's, it, it, was a long, it was a difficult uh, process, let's say. But anyways, in 2004, everybody agreed uh, we were going to uh, have some accountability for the Khmer Rouge crimes. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite a peculiar uh, court. I actually had a nice PowerPoint this morning, but uh, technology failed me. Uh, so I'm going to try and illustrate it as best as I could. It's a hybrid court. It's an internationalized court in which the Cambodian uh, government or Cambodian, uh, of Cambodia has uh, the majority of responsibilities, both administratively and uh, judicially, which is a first in terms of uh, hybrid courts, except maybe for Bosnia. Um, it is based on the civil law system, uh, the continental criminal civil law system, actually specifically France or version of it. Um, and several interesting features are built in the agreement and in the court. Uh, one of which is that there is equivalent on the judicial side uh, of uh, responsibilities. There is two co-prosecutors, a national colleague, my national colleague, Chia Liang, was the only woman uh, judicial officer uh, on the national side, and myself are the co-prosecutors. Uh, we initiate the proceedings. We determine uh, what crimes should be investigated and, if uh, appropriate, who should be investigated for them. And after conducting this preliminary investigation, uh, we forward the case to co-investigative judges, a French investigative judges and a Cambodian, who are tasked with, within the limits of what we uh, give them to investigate, gather all the relevant evidence on both sides of the issue on the mitigating factor as well as the uh, inculpatory uh, side of things. This is the French uh, system, which apparently now Mr. Sarkozy wants to uh, abolish, uh, apparently. Um, then once that investigation is finished and the parties during the investigations, the defense, uh, the civil parties, which I'll get back to later, and the prosecutors monitor the investigations of the co-investigative judges and can request them to take actions or interview witnesses, look at documents, uh, that sort of thing. But once that investigation, according to the judges, is finished, they send back the case to us for our final submission, uh, for our interpretation, let's say, of what it means. Uh, and then once we give them that, they issue a closing order, which is akin to our indictment, and they forward the case to trial, to the trial chamber. At the trial level and at the appeals level, the co-prosecutors are there and have the tasks, uh, according to the statutes, of proving uh, the guilt of the accused beyond a reasonable doubt and, of course, any appeal uh, thereafter. So the co-prosecutors are there from the beginning to the very end of it. Uh, and on the administrative side of it, uh, the court also has this, um, in French it's bicephale, this two-headed two uh, thing going. Um, for example, the head of the administration of the court uh, is a Cambodian national. Uh, the deputy is the UN uh, chief of administration personnel, uh, transport, all these sections have the same uh, type of structure. 
The most important one uh, is the court management section. The court management section has under it all the support functions of the court. It's most, most likely a, like a registry. Um, it has uh, the court managed, the file management, uh, the, the witness support and, and protection, uh, a lot of responsibilities. And I'll come back to it after the, uh, during the challenge uh, part of the, uh, my presentation. Um, the agreement uh, also, of course, gives us jurisdiction on our crimes. We have a temporal jurisdiction of 1975 to 1979 corresponding to the DK uh, era, the Democratic Kampuchea era. Uh, because, of course, when they took power, they also changed the name of the place. It became, instead of Cambodia, Democratic Kampuchea. Um, we have that temporal jurisdiction because, as any of these courts are, they are a, the results of political compromise. They were crimes committed before. They were crimes committed after. Just like in Rwanda, they were crimes committed before the April uh, 6, 1994, and certainly uh, after uh, July 1994. But, uh, you know, as I said, uh, these courts could not exist without those compromises, and one of them is our temporal jurisdiction. Our, I hesitate to use the personal jurisdiction, but certainly the indication of who should be prosecuted, um, and I'll let you know a little bit why I'm, after, why I'm taking this approach and not calling it a jurisdictional criteria. Uh, who we should prosecute is understood, and that's the word of the agreement, is understood to be the senior leaders and those most responsible for the crimes committed during that period. Um, you guys want to come inside? There's, I think there's still a few seats available. I don't think I ever had this, this, <laughs> this many people. I don't know how that reflects on Cleveland on a Saturday morning, but... <laughs> Either that or you've been threatening your students again, Michael. <laughs> um, as I said, we are supposed to prosecute uh, the senior leaders and those most responsible. Uh, senior leaders uh, without, more de you know, without more definition. Now, senior leaders obviously to me you know, means some kind of objective criteria. Where were you in some kind of structure? And what power did you have, de facto or de jure? Most responsible, uh, again to me, refers to your involvement, uh, to the evidence of your responsibility and taking into consideration that these types of events um, you know, need the participations of thousands of criminals uh, who commit various levels of, of atrocity, some of them, you know, most all of them, uh, un unimaginable probably to us, but you know, probably killing a thousand people or being responsible for the killing of a thousand people doesn't even qualify you for, uh, for examination. Um, when you're talking about two, two million people during three years, uh, you know, you need to, to, to shine more than that. Um, but most responsible, uh, again, requires, I would think, uh, an analysis based on the evidence and your level of responsibility taken into account the whole picture. Um, the subject matter of our court uh, is, you know, the usual. Uh, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes. We have crimes against protected person and religious symbols, uh, which is a first uh, for, uh, for uh, international criminal law. And actually, I'm not even sure they are crimes. Uh, I'm not sure why they would put in there. Um, and we have also jurisdiction over national crimes. Now, don't forget, this is a national court. It's called the Extraordinary Chambers within the courts of Cambodia. Um, we have jurisdiction on murder, torture, uh, and religious persecution, which are national crimes. Uh, this, I'll come back to a bit later also, is, uh, has led to some interesting debates within our court. This is not a first, however. In Sierra Leone, we had jurisdiction over national crimes. Uh, I think it was arson, murder. I'm not sure, don't remember exactly which ones we had. But we never charged them. Uh, this was a decision made by David Crane at the time uh, not to prosecute under national law. Uh, we have taken a different approach in our first indictment. We have charged national crimes, uh, although we needed an appeal from the investigative judge's decision to be able to do that. Um, so we have those substantive crimes that are, uh, for the most part, identical or mostly identical, except there's a few, uh, a few twists. Nothing is easy in our court. For example, uh, the genocide uh, definition, uh, the, the, you know, the standard one, uh, instead... Uh, you must seek the, um, to destroy in whole or in part groups uh, 
and committing crimes such as, um, or as such, sorry. We have such as, okay, in our definition. It's obviously a typo, but I'm sure some bright, uh, or I don't know if that's the term, but I'm sure it will be litigated somehow. Um, I've got to watch, even though it's early Saturday mornings. Um, I'm sure this will be litigated, as will other you know, uh, little quirks of our definitions in terms of the crime. But substantially, they're the same as, as other courts. And obviously, we'll uh, try to base our uh, proceedings on precedents. One of the interesting things about the court is that, as I said, it's a national court. So the agreement tells us that we must apply Cambodian law and the agreement for the substantive crime. But procedurally, we must apply Cambodian law. But when there is either a discrepancy, uh, a lacuna, or uh, a clarification, we must seek it in international precedent. Okay. Uh, because of recent history, the law in Cambodia, the criminal law in particular, is, 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 is it's a legal term, it's called a mess. Um, <laughs> there were different legislation passed at different times. The UN passed its own criminal code. Uh, the original criminal code dates from 1956. Up until 2007, there was no procedural, criminal procedural code. Like I said, it's a mess. Uh, so when we did uh, come in in 2006, uh, mindful of that power that given by the agreement to bring in international criminal law. Uh, however, that agreement said that every judicial steps, let's say, or judicial officers could do that on their own. In other words, the co-prosecutors could, at their stage of the game, determine what was the law, and then the co-investigative judges were, do, were free to do the same, and then the judges. Obviously, that didn't make sense. So the judges, for the first year... Uh, worked on the internal rules of the court, which they basically, for the most part, copied what was then a draft of the procedure code of Cambodia uh, and imported into it uh, a lot of safeguards, international criminal law safeguards, to make sure that we were on par. And it's one of the reasons why we, the co-prosecutors, would have one year conducted our preliminary inquiry for uh, investigations for a year before sending the first case to the investigative judges because we were waiting for the playbook. We want to make sure that everybody was playing according to the same rules. Um, so it's, again, a particularity of this court that a lot of the substantive stuff had to be created from scratch. In Sierra Leone, we had, for the first year, we had the rules of the ICTR uh, to, to, get, to guide us. Everybody you know, knew where we were going. And what eventually ended up to be the rules of the Sierra Leone court were basically... Uh, you know, cut and paste job of, of that with some you know, yeah. so but we had to really improvise and um, it's one of the things that I think we should we should we're, we're quite we're quite proud of and I think justifiably so so after the first year the judges uh, passed the rules uh, in a in the uh, in the um, during a plenary and uh, we had been busy uh, our office which again is staffed by both nationals and internationals um, had been conducting preliminary investigations and as soon as the, law, the rules were passed we forwarded our first case uh, it's called an introductory submission in that system uh, and it's basically a, a brief telling the court telling the judges what we found in terms of evidence uh, of the commission of the crimes who we deem responsible and should be investigated for those crimes the legal qualifications of the facts that we've established to our, to our satisfaction, and a request for them to continue investigations. Um, that uh, first submission uh, was quite extensive, and some people <laughs> remember it either fondly or with you know, nightmarish uh, reflexes. But uh, the whole office really worked very, very hard on putting something that we hoped was very comprehensive, because we realized that this was a very important step, obviously. Uh, in the civil system, it could be a one A4 page saying, you know, we found, we believe that these crimes were committed, please investigate. But we took a much different approach, partly based on our experience with international criminal uh, investigations, and partly because, you know, we had the time to do it. Yeah. So we forwarded quite a substantive case, um, 600 pages of text and footnotes, if you remember, Brianne. Uh, and I don't know how many binders, 250 binders, I think, of evidence or, you know. <laughs> Anyways. Um, in that uh, first introductory submission, uh, which was the first time after 1979 that uh, anybody was being held accountable for the crimes of the Khmer Rouge, 
we identified over 25 crime sites, not over, we identified 25 crime sites uh, representing the, you know, a broad spectrum of, of criminal conduct, uh, from murder uh, to extermination, uh, crimes against humanity and war crimes, not genocide. Uh, we further identified five individuals that we said should be investigated and would be responsible or could be responsible for those crimes. Uh, we identified over 300, I think, witnesses, potential witnesses to follow up on uh, and asked the judges to uh, conduct the investigations. Shortly after, uh, well, yeah, shortly after, all of these five individuals were detained. Um, we requested their, their arrest, their detention, uh, and were uh, successful in uh, requesting their pretrial detention. And to this day, they're still detained, although they've all appealed and we all, uh, all, all the... Uh, all the appeals were, uh, well, we won all the appeals. They're still in jail. Um, afterwards, uh, as I said, those five individuals, it was one case. Afterwards, the co-investigative judges decided to split uh, this case and to have one case, uh, a concrete case, with one individual, Doik, uh, a.k.a. Doik, who was uh, the chief of a detention center, of an interrogation and execution uh, center, S21, uh, tool slang, uh, to have that individuals and that fact, that fact base, the S21 case, uh, proceed as a, as a separate case, whilst he and the other four individuals who are more of a national responsibility level, you know, really I think we can call them the architects or the remaining architects of the Khmer Rouge, uh, of the DK, uh, while that case proceeds uh, still to this day, the investigation is still ongoing. Um, Doik's case, however, uh, the S21 case. Uh, the investigation itself closed in May or June of last year. It was forwarded to us, uh, the co-prosecutors, for our final submission. We, uh, we had 30 days and we uh, forwarded our final submission and we requested um, Doik at the time had only been charged by the co-investigative judges with war crimes and crimes against humanity during the investigation from the very beginning almost. Uh, we requested that Doik uh, be further charged with national crimes, and we requested that co-investigative judges apply joint criminal enterprise uh, liability to his actions within S21. The co-investigative judges, uh, in, a, I think, well, in one sentence, uh, deemed that even though the national crimes were proven, uh, they need not be sent for trial. That was the extent of the, the reasoning. And on GCE, uh, I actually didn't mention the words GCE uh, or the, uh, the concept within their closing order. So we appealed that because even though the co-investigative judges have a fundamental responsibility of gather, you know, building the case together, we're the one who end up with it at court. And we thought that it was fundamentally important that the national crimes and GCE be part of that. We appealed that decision. And in December, uh, got a decision from the pretrial chamber. The pretrial chamber is the third uh, chamber of our court. We have the trial chamber and the supreme uh, court chamber. The pretrial chamber was initially created simply, uh, according to the agreement, to deal with disagreements between the co-prosecutors or because the co-investigative judges. From the outset, uh, we all saw that this was a problem, that they needed to be a court that would decide issues that would arise way before we even got to trial. For example, appeals from bail uh, or uh, appeals on bail. You know, if uh, accused were detained by the co-investigative judges, the agreement did not foresee any appeal of that. We thought that was a problem. So we created, uh, we gave the pretrial chamber a lot more uh, jurisdiction, and one of them was to uh, appeal any orders of uh, the co-investigative judges. The co-prosecutors are the only party who have the right to appeal any orders of the co-investigative judges. So we appealed, and, uh, you know, we, we, I got it was a 50-50 thing. Uh, the pretrial chamber decided that Doik should stand trial for national crimes, that there was no reason that he shouldn't. However, on GCE, it basically, uh, and this is on tape, right? Um, on GCE decided that uh, the joint criminal enterprise, because of the fact that the case had been separated, uh, had not been investigated within uh, the S21 case, and therefore the, the accused could not stand trial on it because up until the final submission had not been put on sufficient notice 
that this was going to be uh, part of his uh, case to answer. Um, I'll leave it at that, I think. Um, so uh, after this decision, the case was then sent forward to the trial chamber. Uh, it is expected uh, that uh, the initial hearing, uh, there will be an initial hearing on the 17th of February, I think, uh, uh, to deal with witness issues, uh, more of a house cleaning uh, type of hearing. And then hopefully in March, the actual hearing of evidence, the trial will start. Now, the trial chamber, again, is composed of a mix of judges, uh, three national judges and two international judges. So a majority of national judges. The Supreme Court is five and three. So again, a majority of, of judges. Um, however, for any positive decision, uh, guilty or, or acquittal, there must be a supra-majority. So for example, at the trial chamber level, in theory, uh, if one wanted to be, uh, if the court uh, wanted to find someone guilty, they would have at least four judges who would have to agree together. Okay. This was one of the safeguard built in, uh, actually a solution that, if I'm not mistaken, came from uh, the intervention of John Kerry uh, to save the negotiations, um, to allow both sides to be uh, reasonably certain that things would be uh, uh, above board. Uh, the supermajority is also uh, quite original to, to any court uh, that I know of, anyways. Um, so the trial of Doik hopefully will proceed uh, in March. The investigation, as I said, of... Uh, the, may, uh, the other case is ongoing. Uh, hopefully, we'll finish this year. Uh, I'm somewhat optimistic that we could get a trial this year, uh, but uh, somewhat optimistic. Um, there is, and I'll, you know, I'll probably uh, start the, uh, the challenge part with, with that. Uh, there is uh, other cases that are... Uh, that may or may not come to, to trial, and uh, they are the object of a disagreement between my national colleague and I, which I'll come back uh, in a bit later. But so far, we have these two cases on the dock. Um, we've had some really interesting decisions uh, so far, at least especially in this past year. Um, and there's actually there's more interesting issues than decisions at this point because the pretrial chamber uh, who was called upon to decide a few things uh, deferred a lot of the major decisions uh, based on the facts of the case to the trial chamber so we'll have some again uh, an interesting 2009 hopefully um, some of the ones that that uh, certainly are are, are are obvious is don't forget we're talking about crimes that happened 1975 to 79 so we have to figure out what the law was then so that the accused can be held responsible for something that existed then and not thereafter, right? You're all familiar with the principle. Uh, this can, for example, in crimes against humanity, there is a school of thought that says that at least at that time, uh, for crimes against humanity to be committed, there must have been, there must be a nexus with an armed conflict, whereas now this is not even a question. It might have been at the time. Probably this will be litigated. Uh, you know, the, the application of war crimes and the international versus national uh, conflict, uh, armed conflict. You know, different things. Um, Yang Sari, uh, as you remember, I said he in 1979 he was convicted in absentia. Well, he's still alive. Um, I should have mentioned probably who we have, uh, who we have uh, on, uh, in the dock. We have this individual, Doik, the head of S21. We have Yang Sari, the then Minister of Foreign Affairs. We have his wife, Yang Tirit. Uh, who was a uh, Minister of Social Affairs under the regime. Uh, we have uh, an individual called Nunchea, better known as Brother Number 2, the number two uh, authority in the regime in the DK. Uh, and we have Kyo Sanfan, who was the head of state, the former head of the presidium, the head of state of DK. Uh, those are the individuals which we have in jail. Well, Yang Sari, as I said, benefited from a pardon uh, after his 1979 conviction. Because if you remember, I told you that there was, uh, the Khmer Rouge remained a force to be reckoned with for a few years. And uh, uh, Hun Sen's government finally uh, convinced the remaining uh, Khmer Rouge leaders, Yang Sari, to come in with his troops uh, and uh, Kyo Sampan as well. And in exchange, they got, uh, sorry, Nun Chea, and in exchange got a pardon, Yang Sari did, uh, for his previous conviction. Uh, there was also an amnesty passed for the Khmer Rouge crimes at the time. Uh, and Yang Sari, during an appeal of his detention, uh, was actually forced to bring up these issues because his lawyer had reserved himself the right to bring that up at a later stage. And we said, no, if you want to, you know, these jurisdictional issues should be pleaded at the first 
opportunity because obviously you don't want a court to go on if it has if it doesn't have jurisdiction. So the court forced him actually to agree, to argue it, and he did and lost somewhat. Um, the pretrial chamber uh, decided that uh, because he also pled that he had already been tried for what was essentially uh, uh, crimes against humanity, even though it was called genocide, and cannot be therefore tried again. Well, the pretrial chamber decided that uh, what he had been charged was with genocide, that it was genocide, and if he should and decided not to decide, if decided not to decide, yeah, uh, again, I'll be careful. Um, deferred uh, the, the, the final decision on that because he was not charged and he's still not charged with genocide. All the other four accused are still only charged with crimes against humanity and uh, uh, war crimes. Uh, well, he, hasn't, uh, he wasn't charged, so uh, that argument was, uh, was, not, uh, was not upheld. Uh, his pardon, as well, was not deemed to be an, uh, uh, an obstacle to, uh, to, uh, to prosecution. Uh, and the, the court seemed to agree, uh, although it's not clear, but seemed to agree with one of our arguments that you cannot have a pardon for international crimes. Uh, I think that's now we're, I think it's pretty, an argument can be made that this is uh, the law now, certainly customer international law. Uh, and uh, the pardon and the amnesty did not apply to the ECCC. So that was one interesting issue uh, or a set of issues uh, that will come up again at the trial chamber and hopefully we'll have a definite uh, decision. GCE is another one, uh, as Michael mentioned. Uh, he helped us a great deal uh, in drafting a very good opinion on the applicability of GCE for our court. One of the arguments brought up by the defense is that, first of all, uh, yeah, first of all, that GCE did not exist in 1975, 1979. Uh, uh, and based on several dissenting opinions uh, from ICTY onwards, um, that uh, GCE should not apply, uh, should not uh, apply to uh, our set of facts. Uh, part of the argument being that it is a creation of common law inspired international uh, criminal tribunals. Part of the argument, again, is that it is an artificial uh, creation from the ICTY based on a few uh, jurisprudence from Nuremberg onwards. Um, and that it is it increases the liability of an individuals uh, for uh, n you know uh, needlessly and certainly against his rights that's the arguments of the defense um, we obviously agree that we obviously argue that these crimes are committed uh, the commission of these crimes cannot happen without the application of the, the, I'm sorry cannot happen without individuals agreeing to commit these crimes or agreeing to take part into something that they know will lead to these crimes um, and that are foreseeable consequences of that agreement. Um, at the trial in Yangsari, at the, uh, the pre-trial chamber level, as I said, we will, uh, the question was deferred. Um, in the Doi case, uh, he was uh, not sent uh, for trial on that question. However, the civil law system makes the trial chamber totally independent to consider whatever it wants. Uh, except for the factual basis of the closing order of the indictment. So we will uh, probably uh, argue uh, in front of the trial chamber that GCE is applicable to the ECCC and that Doik should be held accountable for the actions of his subordinates as part of this joint criminal enterprise. Um, although that decision has not been formally reached by my colleague and I yet. Uh, so we will have probably an interesting year in terms of uh, judicial decision. One of them, um, and uh, it certainly represents you know, an illustration of the challenges of this court, um, one, of that de one of those decisions that hopefully will be reached this year is, will there be more cases? Will there be more individuals that will stand trial for you know, two million people dead than those five individuals? Um, another novel aspect of uh, the agreement in the law in our court foresees that the co-prosecutors will not agree on who should be charged for what, foresees that there will be disagreement about prosecution, and has a built-in res conflict resolution mechanism in the agreement. Um, the agreement says that if the co-prosecutors cannot agree, then that disagreement uh, will be resolved by the pretrial chamber. Um, and if you remember, uh, any decision uh, to stop prosecution, let's say, uh, or to forward prosecution, must have this supermajority, four out of five judges. 
If not, the agreement says, the prosecution goes forward. The framers of the agreement foresaw that prosecutors would not agree and that they may be, uh, how should I say, they may be dimensions to this disagreement outside of the realm of the law and the evidence. So therefore, failing to have at least, let's say in theory, one of the international uh, judges agreeing with all these national colleagues to stop a prosecution, then that prosecution by law must go forward. That case must be sent to the investigative judges who can also disagree and who then must go through the same disagreement resolution mechanism. Uh, in uh, November, my colleague and I finally reached a point that uh, we agreed to disagree. Uh, we had, uh, certainly from you know, quite a while ago, uh, at least on the international side of the office, determined that there were few more people who could qualify as senior leader or most responsible for the crimes committed than those five presently accused. It's my personal belief that these courts, although legitimately focused and narrow in terms of the justice that they can deliver, must try to deliver as much of that justice possible, must try to illustrate as substantively as possible the nature of the crimes committed, and the types of individuals who committed those crimes and their liability. You have to paint the picture as much as you can. Within the confines of whatever timeline the framers of the agreement or the, the negotiations agrees to, within you know, a limited budget, um, nobody wants a rogue prosecution and nobody certainly wants to undermine a, uh, the stability of a country or the evolution of a country toward reconciliation and, 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 and rebuilding. But if you're going to do this, you've got to do it right. And you've got to do it in with, as I said, the, the priority of trying to have as many people as possible account for as many of the right crimes as possible. We, or at least I, uh, as I said, became convinced that there were a few more individuals that even within the limits that we have with our court should be prosecuted uh, for the crimes uh, of the era, or at least certainly uh, warrants further investigation by the investigative judges. My colleague does not agree. Um, so we formally, in uh, early December, I believe, uh, filed for a disagreement uh, resolution to the pretrial chamber. That means that we have forwarded our case, our cases, actually, uh, to, uh, to the pretrial chamber for their decision. My position is that the law is clear. If Article 53 tells us that if we, the co-prosecutors, believe that crimes were committed within the jurisdiction of the court, then we can uh, send these crimes to be investigated. And we can identify people that should be investigated uh, along with these crimes. This is our threshold. Uh, and I of the position that once a prosecutor is appointed, then he or she must use, must be, must have an unfettered discretion to exercise his responsibilities and his jurisdiction. My colleague believes, uh, and is on the record as stating, that um, these five presently accused uh, would be enough, would allow for the court to fulfill its mandate, uh, that to go for further prosecution might endanger our funding uh, and might endanger peace and stability in Cambodia. Obviously, I don't believe uh, that's the case. Nobody wants to uh, run the risk of uh, uh, undermining stability in Cambodia, nor do I think uh, I mean, we've been investigating Khmer Rouge for two years now. Nobody has taken to the bush or thrown grenades around. Uh, I don't think, uh, I think Cambodia and its current government uh, are very much uh, stable and mindful of the, the price of peace and will not, uh, these prosecutions would not endanger that. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, I believe that the donors, on the contrary, by seeing that this court is trying to achieve as much justice as possible uh, in accordance with the law and in accordance with international standard, will be motivated to keep on funding our court we are dependent on voluntary donation. That's also something that's a bit different from ICTY and ICTR. They are, their budget are voted and part of the assessed budget of the UN. We're dependent on the kindness of strangers, um, as is Sierra Leone. Um, and hopefully, uh, well, hopefully, the judges of the pretrial chamber will agree and these cases will go forward. I believe that these new cases, although limited, will allow us to, as I said, depict as much as we can uh, of what happened during that era. And that is fundamental because for me, this is quite new in this court and in this, uh, this type of, uh, of work. 
and I'll come back to it at the end, but we are expected to tell history by the Cambodian people. We're expected to answer some really basic questions, and I think that these additional cases will allow us to do that, hopefully. Um, I've hinted already at some of the challenges we're facing. Uh, the most obvious one, and I remember when I, when I got the, the, the letter from Kofi Annan you know, asking me to come to, come to New York and, uh, and, and being interviewed uh, for this job, I remember thinking, wait a minute, how long has this been now? And it's 30 years. These events took place 30 years. This is the longest gap between crimes and accountability in any of these courts. Uh, it brings with it, obviously, you know, some obvious challenges. Uh, the availability of witness, witnesses is the first. The availability of accused is the second one. Uh, our youngest accused, Doik, uh, is 66 now, I think. Um, the oldest one is 86. Uh, they have, you know, aside from Doik, they have some you know, serious health issues that go along with that age. Um, that's one of the challenges, and we've had already motions uh, brought forward that these people should be freed because of their health conditions, uh, or alternative measures to detention should be found. Uh, all of that has been, uh, as I said, dismissed by the, the pretrial chambers. Um, the evidence itself, the effect of, of, uh, on the evidence of the passage of time is also obvious. First of all, forensic evidence. Uh, you know, a very little value 30 years onwards. Um, mass graves, if, if they have, uh, if they're not, uh, if they've been, uh, if they've been found, have generally been excavated. Uh, you know, you, you, you can't really get much forensic value out of, uh, after 30 years. Um, documents. Now, this was a government apparatus for, for three years and eight months. It generated a lot of documents. A lot of it is, has, left, has been left, and a lot of it has served as our basis for these, uh, for these prosecutions. Well, still 30 years after the fact, you need somebody to interpret that language that was you know, seeped into ideology, that communist-inspired uh, uh, um, dia not dialect, but uh, you know, a, a different type of language uh, than even normal. There's the Khmer Rouge Khmer, and there's the normal Khmer. Uh, so you need somebody to put those documents, to put that language into perspective for the judges to understand what it meant at the time. Um, as I said, we have also the questions of the health of our uh, detainees. Um, everybody is very mindful of the Milosevic uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have very few of those most responsible, the senior leaders left, and certainly, I think, uh, so we allege, uh, Nun Chea and Yang Sari uh, and Kyo Sam Pan uh, certainly rank as uh, some of the architects of the regime. If one of them should not see uh, his day in court, uh, it would rob, I think, the process and the Cambodian people of a, of a very important opportunity to tell the story and to understand it. Uh, so hopefully, uh, these individuals will be uh, there for their trial. And the whole process, our whole court from the very first day is very, very much mindful of the need for speed, um, although uh, in these types of tribunals, this is, uh, you, know, you can't do these cases very fast or as fast as you would want to. They're very difficult, especially when, as in our case, you're creating a court from scratch. You're bringing together people who oftentimes can't even speak the same language, uh, who have to apply systems of law that uh, it's foreign to them, uh, who have huge responsibilities, um, and that's one of the, the, you know, another challenge. You have a hybrid court where the national, uh, the national component has the most responsibility, both in terms of judicial responsibility, but also in administrative responsibility. And very few justice system in the world can put together a court to judge these types of cases. And yet, they, the, the Cambodian system, everybody acknowledges is, you know, has some serious deficiencies. They're expected to provide the people to build this court, to run these cases, uh, that would be a major challenge to any developed country in the world. But that's, that's what we have. We are there, the international component, we're there to provide assistance, provide knowledge, and help them. Uh, but, uh, you know, as I said, if you have to have a meeting with an interpreter for any decision, uh, you know, things can't go very fast. There's a built-in difficulty in there. Uh, <clears throat> the application of the civil system, or the continental civil system, to that extent has never been done in an internationalized tribunal. National civil system have done, the Belgians have done genocide cases. Uh, it took them, you know, with all the, the, the powers and experience of their system and the familiarity of them, took them about 
six years, I think, of, uh, of, of investigation with the magistrates. Um, and their trials lasted between a month and, and three months. Well, but in an internationalized setting, with importing into it international criminal law precedent and international uh, personnel, it's the first time that the civil system will be tested to that extent. Hopefully, we'll get the best of both worlds, right? <clears throat> the civil system is supposed to have long investigation where judges gather all the evidence, and there's therefore no question of admissibility uh, of evidence at the trial, and therefore the trial it's, and the rights are protected within the investigation of the accused and the parties, and the trials therefore are short because all the relevant evidence has already been gathered. It's in the file. The judges uh, have read it. They understood it. They lead the evidence. They ask the parties their opinion, and then they can render judgment very quickly. <clears throat> International criminal tribunals, for the most part, are common law inspired, where the prosecution leads the uh, or conducts the evidence. It's an adversarial uh, uh, hearing, and the judges just you know uh, do the Solomon thing and decide. And the trials can be very long because all the evidence gets heard and put into the file during this public hearing. We're all, again, as I said, we're all hoping that we're going to be able to manage both uh, the best and bring the best of both systems into, uh, into this process. Um, one of the main challenges that we had is our limited resources. I think by the time we came around, it's quite clear that the donor uh, community has experienced a bit of fatigue with uh, these international tribunals and certainly wants to send a message that these courts have to be lean and mean and fast. Right. The consequences of this is that our structure wa who was elaborated uh, within those negotiations by people who had actually been in court, well, that structure was then handed over to accountants in the various embassies and, 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 and governments and came back with all kinds of little cuts uh, that ended up with a structure and a budget that just did not make sense in terms of what was expected of us. So we ran out of money. Um, and actually, as we did in Sierra Leone, uh, actually, I still remember the registrar in Sierra Leone sending everybody a note, you know, you know, please be aware that in 30 days, you know, you might be out of a job and update your CV in consequence. Uh, well, we faced the same thing in, in Cambodia. <clears throat> and we've had, we had a budget, I think, 56 million that was expected to last for three years that ran out within, I think, the first year and a half. Uh, and we had to put together a budget proposal and asking for more money. Uh, the United States, up until last year, did not contribute any money to the court. It was barred, uh, if I understood correctly, uh, by uh, the laws uh, of the country to give us any money. Now, uh, because they are, uh, or the United States government is reasonably certain that the process was going to be, is going to be up to international standards, they have started funding. We got 1.8 million, which we're very grateful of. But we want and need more. Um, the major donors of the court are Japan and France. Uh, Japan is obviously a major player in the area and, is a, a, and in Cambodia in particular. And France has a, 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 you know, the connection of being, uh, Cambodia being a former colony uh, and, of course, the civil system uh, aspect of this. And uh, the, Francophone, the Francophony uh, impact in Asia of Cambodia. But, um, you know, we, are, uh, we have gotten additional funding. But again, on voluntary basis, Japan just announced 21 million uh, that would go to the UN side of uh, the outfit. Uh, the ECC side of, uh, of, of the court is running out of money, I think, this time in February. Ne yeah, the next month, I think. And theoretically, could, you know, the whole thing could grant, to a, could grant to a halt. I don't think that's going to happen. I think we are going to be this court, uh, more than Sierra Leone, uh, expected to reach some milestones before we give in some cash. Um, which is fair enough, but it obviously builds in a, a, you know, a difficult, another challenge in the process. Uh, and even with the, the budget that we've, the supplementary budget that we asked for, it's still the, the leanest of all these courts, and we have little means. That's why we're dependent on, on, on people like uh, Michael and uh, the bright guys and, and, and girls who work with him uh, to, to give us assistance. Um, and we have other uh, agreements with other universities and even law firms, uh, most of them in the United States, for pro bono assistance because we need the resources that we don't have uh, with our budget. Uh, one of the... Uh, well, actually, one of the memos that somebody is working on uh, now uh, for us is about corruption. One of the challenges that we have is the credibility itself of the court. As I told you earlier, I believe that these additional cases will 
I think, uh, lend credibility to our process. But that, uh, that credibility is, 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 um, is under attack to a certain extent by allegations of corruptions within the court, administrative corruption. Uh, the allegations is or are that as is the case apparently uh, or as is alleged uh, throughout the Cambodian uh, uh, systems, uh, government system, one must pay to get a job and one must keep on paying to keep his or her job. This is what is alleged to uh, have been and still may be taking place within the administrative side of the court on the Cambodian side. These allegations came out uh, uh, quite uh, clearly and, fr and, and forcefully uh, through NGOs. There, were an invest there was an investigation by the UN uh, investigative arm, although, as I said, the, uh, the corruption is supposed to be taking place on the uh, national side. That report was handed over to the national side, and there is a lot of pressure on the national government uh, to address these allegations uh, quite uh, transparently and, 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 and comprehensively. Of course, uh, this is an issue that's, uh, 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 that's already being litigated by the defense. Uh, one of the defense team, the defense team for Nunchia, has asked the National Municipal Court to investigate the head of the administration and I think the deputy prime minister and a few other people uh, for these alleged uh, corruption. Uh, and it's obviously an issue that's not going to go away. Uh, the uh, Office of Legal Affairs of the UN has came to Cambodia, a high-level delegation, and uh, have agreed to form a working group to address this. But it's obviously a concern. It's a concern to the international uh, judicial uh, officials who came to Cambodia uh, to bring a, an international standard level of justice to the process. Uh, and certainly, allegations of corruption, any corruption, is, is, is uh, quite an issue uh, for us. Hopefully, it will be addressed uh, in a more uh, in, in, in the right way. Um, and there's always been uh, allegations of political interference uh, apprehended or, 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 or realized with our process. Um, there are some that have said openly uh, that uh, the government of Cambodia does not want more than these five presently detained suspects uh, because of various reasons, that they do not want, or some people in the government of Cambodia do not want uh, the era uh, um, to be under too close of a scrutiny because they were themselves former Khmer Rouge. They themselves had posts of the same types or the same authority level as those that could be investigated by us, that the story could be told uh, to the public, and then the questions asked, well, if you're prosecuting this guy, why not this guy? That sort of thing. <clears throat> and it's been alleged uh, recently in the, in the media that this disagreement uh, and the position of my colleague reflects that, uh, that, that will uh, to limit the prosecutions. Uh, I have to say that I personally uh, you know, don't feel that I'm under any political interference of any sort. Um, my colleague and I uh, keep our, uh, and all the members of our team, and as Michael uh, and I, I'm really happy uh, for you to mention that, and I'm, pre I'm pretty, very proud of that fact. We are working still together very well uh, on these new, ca on these cases, these present cases, even though we are have disagreed, Liang and I. We're working fine, and we, I have no doubt that we'll keep on working on uh, on these cases. If the pretrial chamber does decide that new cases go forward, then uh, I think obviously our, our our the international side of the office will manage that, uh, and hopefully, I'm um, I'm convinced of it. We will still keep on going the way we are. Uh, but it is one of the peculiar challenges of, of this court. And lastly, and I'm sorry if I took more time, imagine that a lawyer talking too much. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest challenges for me anyways, personally, is the expectations of Cambodia and the Cambodian people uh, for this court. We, the court is expected to answer some really basic questions. And you have to remember that 30 years has passed, right? And there's a huge amount of information that has been gathered about what happened. Okay? These people have made careers out of you know, uh, establishing or, or at least you know, saying that they've established what happened, who did what to whom and why, right? There's a huge amount of information, uh, documents, videos, you, n name it, okay, available. And one of the first challenges that we had was 
the expectation that we shouldn't take any time and any money to establish what happened. We all know what happened. It's all there. The evidence is all there. You know? Why are you taking so much time and so much money? You have that in other courts, but not to that extent. Okay? Because usually the courts are fresher after the events and there's not that built-in you know, belief. So the first job you have, and the first job we had, was to tell people that there's a huge difference between information and evidence. There's a huge difference between believing that something happened and proving it beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay? Um, but, I mean, mind you, it's the same challenge on a different level in national court. The victim knows what happened to him or her, okay? but you have to explain to them that it doesn't matter, that we still have to prove it to a judge who well, wasn't anywhere near that and still has to be you know, convinced. But as I said, we're also expected to answer questions as to why it happened. One of the first outreach sessions that I went to it hit me, it, it really hit me. These young people would come into the mic and ask, why did they do it? Why did Khmer kill Khmer? Not Vietnamese killing Khmer, we understand that. We've been doing that for you know thousands of years. Uh, but why did Khmer kill Khmer? And why did they, even when they got the power, why did they kept on doing it? It wasn't clear then, because it was done for these you know, I, or at least, you know, with a veneer of ideology over it, because, at the, you know, at the end of the day, it's still about power. But it wasn't clear then why people were being victimized, and because of the recent history, because of the fact that up until this year, it, that period has never been part of the curriculum in schools, in education in Cambodia. It's not taught in school what happened. Well, you got a whole generation, the majority of the population in Cambodia is under 30 because of the events. Well, you got a whole generation who have no idea why they don't have grandparents, or why their parents won't talk about you know, these, these four years almost. And even when they do talk about it, and there was a, an NGO who did a very powerful documentary on that, even when these parents do tell their children, the children don't believe them. And you had, and I still remember, you had this family with the, you know, the kids 15, 18, whatever. Their parents are telling them what happened, and the kids are going, ah, I don't believe you. So you have, even when the parents are willing to talk about what happened to them, you have you have kids or the next generation who don't believe it. We're expected to help establish that. It's obviously going to be a big uh, part of our legacy uh, that we leave behind the product of our work so that this generation and anybody else who wants to can find their own answers to their own questions and we can tell the story. It's a particular challenge, um, as I you know, allu briefly alluded to, one of many. Um, Hopefully, I'm still reasonably hopeful uh, that we can meet those challenges. We're the only chance, we're the only court that's going to do that. We're the only chance for Cambodians to have some accountability for what happened. National courts are not going to undertake this, even though legally they can. There's no Truth and Reconciliation Commission envisioned. Kids are going to be start being taught about this period during uh, this year and only. We are the best chance for Cambodian Cambodians to have some justice for, for what happened uh, during that period. And with the help of uh, people like you, Michael, and your students, and the international community, and the national, obviously, the national component, hopefully we can achieve, we can achieve that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Somehow I knew you were going to be the first one, because I saw you written here. Yeah. Okay, my, my question is basically uh, what, why national courts in, instead of international courts? I mean, uh, isn't, uh, I, I mean, with a national court, aren't you uh, subject to, to the criticism that, uh, that it's, it, it's like it's, it, it's a national court uh, that it, that has one ideology trying other people uh, who, who has murdered people, who is engaged in mass murder in, in the service of, of, of another ideology. Uh, isn't it better uh, to have international courts with, the, with international judges as, as ideology free as possible, judging defendants uh, accused of, of mass murder in, in the service of, of any ideology? Uh, I thank you for that question. It's a very, it's a, it's a very good one. Um, and short, you know, short answer, no. Ideally, you want the victims 
or the representative of the victims, the national system judging the perpetrators. Okay, that's, that's the best solution. If, however, a national system cannot do that, then the next best thing, uh, and again, I have experience in both types, the next best thing is a hybrid court. It is a court that is in the place where the crimes happen, where the victims can come and see justice being done, but has this built-in component of international personnel who have no personal stake in the matter, in the subject matter, and who will bring some guarantees to the process. For example, in, in ICTR, where I started my, my international career, the court was 5,000 kilometers away in another country. The investigations were taking place in Kigali, and that's where I was based, not Arusha, I was based in Kigali. The investigations were taking place in the country where it happened, but the results and the guilt or the innocence and the facts were all getting established 5,000 kilometers away, where Rwandans could not see it. And we missed the boat completely on outreach with ICTR, and it allowed our message and what was happening in our court to be completely filtered through the media, to NGOs, to the government, to anybody who wanted to, because we were not there, and people could not come and see. In Sierra Leone, I remember that when we opened the first trial, huge lines of people to come and see this justice being done, to hear the story. Mind you, as the, you know, as the time goes by, you know, people go back to their normal lives, and also because they don't find the answers they're expecting. People come to these trials wanting to know who killed their father or why was her sister raped. But what they hear is crime-based evidence, things that we have to prove the, for the massive or systematic nature of the, of the crimes, and then linkage evidence to these guys who are on trial who never got their hands dirty, who never killed you know, anybody's brother or sister. Uh, so people tend to drift away. And that's why, as I said, legacy is important. We have to leave the work product behind so people can find their own answers. But ideally, you want a hybrid court if it's possible. In Rwanda, you know, we, weren't, we couldn't. Right after the genocide, there was no way we could establish a court there and have any semblance of, of impartial justice. ICTY, same difference. Uh, but you can and should strive to have a hybrid mechanism by which there's a very strong national component you know, bringing accountability to their own crimes. You know, it's not my family who was victimized. You know, and I, when this process is over, I'll go home. But people who have lived through this or whose families have lived through this, they should have a direct influence and impact on how accountability for these crimes are done. So if you can, then you should have an international hybrid tribunal. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you for the extraordinary lecture this morning, initially. Uh, Thank you. Are you liberty to share how the judges, both Cambodian nationals and uh, non-Cambodian uh, judges, were selected for the various levels of the court? Um, the national judges were selected, obviously, by the national government. Uh, the international judges were selected by the UN. Um, not sure, how, not sure how they came up with a list, uh, but eventually, uh, after you know the selection process, the further selection process, that list of internationals was submitted to the government of Cambodia because, as I said, it's a Cambodian court, and it's the Council of the Magistracy who decided among the list of internationals who would be named. So the candidates were put forward by the UN with alternates because we have reserved uh, some. Some of us have reserved uh, prosecutor or judges. So, for example, if, if I can't serve, I have, well, it's not clear actually that I still have, but actually at the time I had a reserve uh, co-prosecutor who could come in. So, for my position, let's say two names were submitted to the royal government of Cambodia, and they selected one as the active and one as the reserve. Uh, but the criteria used obviously were, you know, hopefully significant experience in, in international criminal law, or at least in criminal law, uh, and in some, some cases for the, the, the civil system of it. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about? Excuse me. Uh, talk a little bit about the uh, the nature of the crimes that are involved. The you mentioned that the there were twenty five uh, crime sites. What's the scope of what's at stake there? Okay. One of the one of the other challenges that we've had, and I didn't think about, I didn't talk about, is the transparency of the process. In the civil system, the investigation is confidential, right? 
So, for example, when we sent our introductory submission, we, we, we issued a press release that just said 25 crime sites of different nature. Because by law, we cannot reveal the details. Okay? And it's one of the issues we've, we've had. Don't remember, again, there's people have been waiting 30 years to have explanations about what happened. And now we come in, we're all there, we got all this money, we're working, we're working, but we can't tell you what we're doing. And it's been part of the frustrations we've been having to deal with. So I can't really go into much details about what is presently under investigation. Uh, Sufficient, uh, suffice to say that they represent, at least in our perspective, in the co-prosecutor's perspective, you know, as broad a spectrum of the types of crimes that were committed. It's no secret that there were detention centers all over the, the country. We forwarded some of those. Uh, it's no secret that there were killing fields or areas where massacres happened. We've identified some of those. Um, cities were evacuated, as I said. <coughs> <coughs> the capital of Phnom Penh is being the most uh, well-known. Again, uh, obviously, it's part of our uh, it's part of our case, uh, but unfortunately, I can't you know go into too much detail. Sorry. Yes, please. Are there rules of evidence, and if so, what are their source governing things such as authenticity and hearsay? Yeah. As I said, we have a civil system, okay, and uh, the rules of evidence of that system have actually been adopted by other international criminal courts, which are more common law uh, inspired. But everybody from the beginning realized that our common law rules of admissibility of evidence would not work in this system. Okay? You cannot have a, a chain of custody uh, issues. You cannot uh, disallow hearsay uh, from being admissible. Everything has to go to the judge to be properly weighed if it's relevant. And that's the civil system. Okay? That's what they get paid for. Right? So, right? Uh, and that's, as I said, that's the civil system and that's the rules that govern all these international criminal tribunals. If the evidence is relevant and not redundant or uh, not going against, uh, uh, um, you know, for example, torture evidence, uh, that sort of thing, if that evidence is relevant, then it goes to the judges and then they weigh it. We can choose to do whatever they want with it, but it goes in. So this is the system that we have. You have to have that. Otherwise, I mean, I don't know how I could, you know, illustrate it. Uh, okay. I remember when the Belgians did one of their, when their first case, their first genocide, Rwandan genocide case. Okay? It was a very narrow, for, there was four accused, two were nuns, Catholic nuns, uh, that were accused of having uh, incited and actually uh, incited the murders of refugees that were in a garage near their place, uh, Tutsi refugees, and actually had, had paid for the gas uh, that was used to burn the place down with them inside. Okay? Mm -hmm. And a lot of these Tutsis uh, men who were in the garage were married to Hutu women, you know, people, peasants, you know, just basic farmers. And I remember I was in Belgium for the opening of the trial, and then the Belgian TV went down to Rwanda and interviewed one of those widows that was going to come in, you know, to, to come and testify in Belgium. And that woman had never been out of her hill, not even to the capital of Kigali. And in a couple of days, they were going to fly her off to Belgium spend three or four you know, a week about okay, in a totally foreign environment, come into this huge, massive courtroom in Brussels, you know, you, you scare the hell out of anyone, you know, even the innocent, uh, and testify in this, well, people were speaking all kinds of languages that she couldn't understand, and was expected to tell the most horrifying part of her life. Right? And they were interviewing this woman while she's, you know, going, trying to figure out what's, what's the, the good beans from the bad beans from her crop. And she, they're, they're asking a question. All of a sudden, she stops answering, and she looks at the journalist. She said, I don't have any shoes. Do you think they'll give me shoes? So if you try and apply our common law rules of evidence to people like that and to their story, you'll never get anywhere. Okay? Rules of, uh, uh, that, that are meant to work in systems that have hundreds of years of tradition, that have the same culture as anybody who's, who's, who's involved in them. They're just not going to work to bring together the necessary evidence to know what happened in these cases. So all these courts have said that if it's relevant, we'll consider it and then we'll decide what it means. And that's how, for example, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda now has taken judicial notice of a genocide. We don't have to prove that in 1994 a Tutsi genocide occurred in Rwanda. The judges have taken as a fact, just as the sun rises in the east, that there was a genocide because they've taken that expansive approach and that heavy, heavy responsibility that comes with it. They must weigh that evidence. They must be in their own self-convinced of that 
strength of that evidence before they decide. So those are the rules of evidence. Yes? Um, you mentioned joint criminal enterprise theory a few times and how uh, it may or may not be accepted by the ECCC. Uh, could you explain a little bit about what joint criminal enterprise theory is and how you hope Morning. it? What? Yeah, sorry. Morning. Sorry. And how you hope, <laughs> and how you hope to apply it to, uh, to the Khmer uh, to the Khmer Rouge trials? I hope lunch is good, Michael. Mm. No, seriously, joint criminal enterprise is. Anyways, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm you know uh, I'll be expected to say that, but to me, it's nothing new. Is how these types of crimes have, have been committed from 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 the beginning. Okay, uh, it's basically a, a theory of accountability that holds you responsible for crimes committed by the people you have agreed with to commit a certain crimes, or by people who committed crimes in furtherance of that agreement, but that you don't necessarily had agreed to commit, but was a foreseeable consequence of. Let me give you an example. I hope I better more clear than what I just said. Uh, let's say you send into a village, okay, four armed guys, okay, of a particular ethnic group who are under your orders, okay, uh, or you help them go into that village where members of another group, another ethnic group, with whom you're at war or with whom you intend to displace, rather, okay, and kick them out of the country. Uh, you send these guys in with weapons and you tell them, you know, make them move, make them go away. Okay? I don't want them in here anymore. You don't tell them to kill anybody. But you give them weapons, you prime them, and you tell them that the objective, which is a crime, is to you know, get them out. And one of these villagers gets killed in the process by one of these four guys. Was that a foreseeable consequence? Did you know or could you know, could you foresee that by doing the acts that you did, by facilitating the commissions of those acts, that one crime would be committed, even though you didn't tell them to commit that crime? That's, you know, that, that's one type of joint criminal enterprise. You are held responsible for that even though you didn't tell them to do it, but it was a foreseeable consequence. Another type is where, let's say you are in charge of feeding the guards uh, or making sure that the guards of the concentration camps are being fed and well taken care of and paid on time, etc. You're not killing anyone. You're not torturing anyone. But you know darn well what's happening and you know darn well that what you're doing is helping them commit those crimes. That's also one type. So basically that's, like I said, it's being responsible for the, not only your own actions, but also for the, the actions of others and having the necessary intent through that uh, uh, agreement. And how, are you to apply this to and how are you trying to apply this to uh, the five men who are currently on trial at the ECCC? Well, I can't... Uh, Again, that's coming closer to the facts that, that I, can, uh, I can really talk about. But if you think about, as I said, this was a government apparatus that for three years, eight months, and 20 days stated that nobody had any rights, that you had to do what they told you to do, and that took any necessary steps to achieve the aims of their, uh, their plans, including the commissions of crimes. You know, you can draw your own conclusions. Yes? Given the financial limitations that you mentioned and the possibility that you could actually run out of money, is the defense using delay tactics as a means of hoping that... God forbid! <laughs> how dare... Get him out! And if so, how are you dealing with that? Yeah, no. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't... I, didn't. I meant to be facetious, but uh, it's without foundation. Um, no, there are... Uh, listen... The defense in these types of, especially in these types of tribunals, is fundamental to the credibility of the process. If you don't have a full and active and competent defense, what you got at the end isn't worth the effort. Okay? In East Timor, when I got there in 2002, it was at the beginning of, relatively at the beginning of this, it was the worst professional experience because on the other side, you had kids as, as defense lawyers. People who had just come out of law school who had no experience, who were being helped you know, by internationals, but the program at the time was very in its inception. And as a prosecutor, then you have to do both jobs. You have to make sure that you're 
completely above board. You can't count on anyone to keep you in check. You have to do it yourself. Because as I said, otherwise, the judgment you get at the end is worthless. Right? And the whole idea is getting to the truth and having something that is unassailable. In these types of cases, and as is the, court, as is the case in, in, uh, in, uh, in Cambodia, the defense must try to explore all issues that it can. Okay? And of course it results in delays, but it's not really a delay. This is part of the process. Uh, you know, and for the most part, uh, I think it's been, it's been fundamental to, 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 to our credibility, the issues that have been litigated. You know? I mean, obviously at the end we'll see what, you know, uh, we'll have a better idea, I think, at the end of the process, what would really, you know, what was warranted and what may, may not have been. Uh, yeah. You know, for example, one of the defense uh, teams, that of Kyo Sampan, uh, represented by Jacques Vergès, who's a French attorney, uh, defense attorney, who was the object of a documentary a couple of years ago, the, um, the Devil's Advocate. You might, you might have, some of you might have seen it. Well, his approach is that as long as the whole file is not translated into French, he's not doing anything. So he has not, or they have not filed any request for uh, investigative action to the co-investigative judges. They have not filed any motion of anything except to say that they want the whole case in file in French. Um, that is their uh, defense so far. At the end of the process, we'll judge if, it, you know, if there was something else that could have been done or should have been done. Other defense uh, teams have taken a, a you know, different approach uh, and raised different issues. But in all seriousness, if you don't have, and I hope that all these defense teams will be as competent and as strong and as active as possible, because you want, at the end, the whole thing to be tested thoroughly so that people can believe it. Who funds the defense? Uh, there's a defense office that's created by the agreement with the head of the defense office that supports defense teams. Defense teams, again, have the same uh, double-headed thing, uh, an international consul and a national consul with a mixed team behind them. And the defense uh, office has a budget on its own, uh, funded by the international community. Uh, part of our international budget goes to the defense office and they fund the defense teams. Yes? Yeah, uh, you were talking uh, about... <laughs> Making you walk, eh? <laughs> yeah, you were talking about the uh, legacy of the, of the trial once it's completed. Uh, what, what are the strategies for managing the, the legacy of the trial uh, in, a, in a society that really has demolished civil uh, institutions? Well, it's rebuilding, and there's, there, you know, it's, 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 it's going to be a long process, but there, there's, you know, it's, it's a relatively modern society, and it's getting better and better. Um, but the legacy aspect is, uh, again, fundamental, okay? Um, we didn't, when I say we, you know, we were at, who, who, we are, who were at the beginning of these, these courts, we didn't take that into account when we started working, and then they're all catching up now. Okay. They got tons of documents, uh, tons of uh, electronic uh, uh, information with different softwares, uh, in, you know, different ways of keeping them. We all now are coming to grasp with leaving this behind in a, in a, in a useful way. Um, ideally, you want to do it you know, at the, from the very beginning. Make the decisions that count. How are you going to keep your files in what format, in what way, so that at the end you know, you have, you're easier. Um, it's easier. We have put together finally, you know, and I'm I'm, I'm proud to say at the, the at the initiative of the, the the OCP, we put together a working group on legacy, and it's much more than just the file. However, I mean, we're thinking about, you know, how much. One of the things that we're supposed to do this court is supposed to show Cambodian how to render justice, right? How to do it the right way, in the efficient way. Well, part of that, uh, part of our legacy, for example could be to ensure that there's funding after we are gone for our national colleagues who worked with us for four or five or years, when they go back to their own justice system, to have money to uh, allow for interns or for bar students uh, to come and work with them, and that you know, those work methods that they've learned are passed on, and you know, that there's a ripple effect there. Again, as I, you know, archives as well, how we keep our archives, how we make, you know, we have a very exciting project since it's an inception, I can't, I can't really talk about it, but a very exciting project with some major American uh, institutions uh, that, would, that conceivably could allow, for example, uh, for an electronic tribunal 
whereas you could go and with let's say satellite offices left behind in Cambodia after we leave in each of the main cities where somebody could go and then watch the trial unfold as it was and click on any pieces of evidence that is being referred to by one of the persons talking and see that piece of evidence on a split screen you know there's there's lots of things to be done unfortunately it requires money uh, however legacy Legacy programs are usually not that hard to fund. They're very sexy for donors because, you know, first of all, it's it's uh, it's nonpartisan. It's the you know it's the product of of the court, uh, not of one party, to it. And everybody realizes now uh, that if you don't put that into place, then when you go, you you know you haven't made the impact that you could have. Okay, Sierra Leone is going to be the first cl uh, court to close. They're now dealing very actively with this. We're hopefully going to learn from their uh, their experience and hopefully get the funding to do it right. Robert, let me thank you again for taking the 35-hour trip from Phnom Penh to Cleveland and coming here. This really was an extraordinary morning, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much.